Okay, so welcome to this next video in the playlist on group theory. In this video, what we're going to talk about is conjugation of a subgroup. Okay, right. Uh, so, in previous videos in this playlist on group theory then, we have seen the concept of conjugation of an element of a group uh, by another element of the group. Okay, what we're going to introduce then in this video is the concept that you can also conjugate an entire subgroup of a group to get another subgroup. Okay, so let me show you this. So firstly, let's start off then with the uh, setup. Okay, so we're going to need a group to work with. Okay, so we'll call our arbitrary group capital G. Okay, and we'll let this rectangle here denote the set that underlies the group capital G. Okay, so we'll colour in capital G in red, and this uh, rectangle is the set of elements in the group capital G. Okay, and of course, you also have a composition law defined on this, which will need to obey the axioms of group theory for it to actually be a group. Okay, but there's our picture of the set of the group, at least. Okay, right. Uh, now the next thing that we need is we need some subgroup of the group capital G. So let's say that capital H is going to be a subgroup of capital G. Okay, so I'll now mark capital H on here. So let's say that this sub-portion of capital G, this subset, is going to represent our subgroup capital H. And I'll outline capital H here in green. So here is our subgroup capital H of our group capital G. Okay, right. Now what we're going to do then is we're going to conjugate our subgroup capital H by some other element of our group. Okay, so I'm going to add one final thing onto this picture, which is a little g. Okay, and this little g is some arbitrary element of our group capital G. Okay, now it could in principle be within the subgroup capital H, or it could be outside of the subgroup capital H, as I've drawn it here. It's just some arbitrary element of the group capital G. Okay, right. So what we're now going to do is we're going to conjugate uh, the subgroup capital H by uh, this element, little g. Okay, and I'm going to define what that's going to be equal to. So the way it's written is very intuitive. We just write gh. Okay, so we've got our subgroup in the middle, g inverse. Okay, so we write it just like we would write conjugation of an individual element, but then we have the capital H denoting the fact that that's a set rather than just an individual element. Okay, so we're going to conjugate our subgroup capital H by this element little g, under this element little g. Okay, right, so what am I going to define this to be equal to? Okay, well I'm going to define this to be the subset of capital G, which contains all of the elements of the subgroup capital H conjugated by little g, which is the very intuitive thing to do. Okay, so if we want to work out what the conjugate of this subgroup capital H by the element the little g is, all we're going to do is conjugate every single element, so every single little h, which is an element of capital H by um, this element little g. Okay, we're going to collect all of the answers together and stick them all into a set, and that's going to be the conjugate of our subgroup capital H under this element little g. So this is going to be the subset that contains all things of the form gh g inverse, where h is an element of capital H. So you go through all of the elements of the subgroup capital H, you conjugate them all by little g, you collect all of the answers together into a set, okay, and this is now going to be the new set, which is the conjugate of my subgroup capital H under this element little g. Okay, right, so that's how I'm going to define uh, the conjugate of a subgroup under the element little g. Now the first thing to note is that if little g is in fact an element of the subgroup capital H, then this is going to have absolutely no effect, because if little g is an element of capital H, then when I conjugate all of the elements of the subgroup capital H by uh, that uh, element, so little g we're now imagining is an element of the subgroup capital H. When I conjugate all of the elements of my subgroup capital H by some element of that subgroup, okay, all I'll do is end up sending the entire subgroup capital H back onto the subgroup capital H. Okay, all the answers that I will get will be back within the 
subgroup capital H and I will actually get every single element of the uh, subgroup capital H back again so this will actually just equal um, the subgroup capital H so G H G inverse will equal capital H if G is an element of capital H okay and that's because uh, conjugating by an element in this way um, will represent a set permutation of the subgroup capital H. Remember we can always find uh, this group action of a group on itself by conjugation where conjugation is going to represent a set permutation, a bijective map. So when we act G on all of the elements of capital H, capital H is fundamentally a, a group after all, we will just get the entire group back again because it the interpretation of this as a set permutation as a bijective map. Okay, so if G is an element of capital H, then conjugation is going to have no effect. It's more interesting when G is outside of capital H. Okay, right, so what I now want to prove then is that this conjugate of H under the element little g is always going to be a subgroup of capital G as well. So when I conjugate the subgroup capital H by some element of the group, whatever element of the group I pick, this is actually going to be a subgroup of capital G. Now, so far, what we know is that it's going to be a subset. Okay, that's clear from the definition. It's not clear yet that it's going to be one of these special subsets that is actually a subgroup. Okay, so let me mark it on the picture initially. So let me put the conjugate of capital H by this element little g here. Okay, so this subset is representing GH, G inverse, and I think I'll stick to colouring it in orange. So this is representing uh, the conjugate of the subgroup capital H under the element little g. And there will always be a non-empty intersection between the conjugate of the subgroup capital H under the element little g and the subgroup capital H. And the reason for that is that the identity element is going to, at the very least, be in both of them. Okay, we know because capital H is a subgroup, it must contain the identity element. Why does the conjugate of the subgroup under the element little g always contain the identity element? Well, because when we conjugate the identity element, which is an element of the subgroup capital H, by any little g, when we do g e g inverse, which we will end up at some point doing because we go over all the elements of the subgroup capital H and conjugate them by little g to construct the conjugate of our subgroup, Okay, when we do this, of course, the identity might as well not be there. Okay, so this just is G composed with G inverse, which is equal to the identity. So the identity will always end up being within the conjugate of our subgroup under the element little g, no matter what little g you pick from the group capital G. Okay, right, so the, the identity is always going to be there, that, and that's why on this picture I can happily show an intersection between the conjugate of my subgroup capital H and the actual subgroup capital H. Okay, right, uh, so what I now want to do is actually prove that this conjugate of the subgroup capital H under the element little g is actually going to be a subgroup in its own right. Okay, so as always, when I'm trying to so show rather uh, that a subset of a group is a subgroup, I don't need to worry about the axiom number two of group theory because the inherited composition law on this subset uh, will always obey associativity. So I just need to make sure of axiom number one, three, and four. Okay, so let's start with axiom number one. So axiom number one of group theory says that it must be closed under composition. So when I take any two elements from my subset and compose them together with the inherited composition law from the larger group capital G, I must get another element that is within my subset. Okay, it can't be outside of my subset. Okay, so quite simply, I need to start by taking two arbitrary elements from my subset, which is this conjugate of the subgroup under the element little g. So I need to start by taking two arbitrary elements from here and then show that if I compose them together, I'll end up with another element here. Okay, now what does an arbitrary element from here look like? Well, it looks like something of the form g h g inverse, where h is some element of the subgroup. Okay, so if I want two arbitrary elements from this subset, they'll look like this, g h 1 g inverse, 
and GH2 G inverse, where H1 and H2 are potentially different elements of uh, the subgroup capital H. So H1 and H2 are arbitrary elements from capital H. Okay, and then these two things that I've got here then, okay, which I'll underline in red here, these are arbitrary elements of my subgroup capital H conjugated by the element little g. Okay, so I've got these two arbitrary elements then of my subset here, okay, and what I want to do is prove that if I compose these two together, that I'll end up with another element that's in here. So quite simply, let's do it. So let's take gh1, g inverse, this first element, and compose it with gh2, g inverse. Okay, and this is where something beautiful happens, because the g inverse and the g in the middle here are going to cancel, and this therefore is going to become gh1 composed with h2, g inverse. Okay, now why is it the case that this thing then that we're left up with here is an element of uh, my subset here? Why is it the case that this is something in the conjugate of the subgroup capital H under the element of G? Well, because things in this subset here are of the form an element of the subgroup capital H conjugated by the element G. And indeed, this is exactly of that form. We've got H1 and H2, which are arbitrary elements of my subgroup capital H. So when I compose H1 and H2 together, I will also end up with an element of my subgroup capital H. So in the middle here, I have some element of the subgroup capital H conjugated by uh, the element little g. So this must be an element of the conjugate of the subgroup capital H under the element little g. Okay, so indeed what I've done then is I've taken two arbitrary elements of this uh, subset, the conjugate of the subgroup capital H under the element little g, composed them together and shown that the answer must be another element of the uh, conjugate of the subgroup H under the element little g. Okay, so I've shown that it is indeed closed under the inherited composition law that it has on it. Okay, right. Uh, so now what I want to do is make sure of the other two axioms that I need to check. So axiom number three. Okay, well we've already actually done axiom number three. Axiom number three says that the uh, subgroup must contain the identity elements so that it has an identity. Okay, uh, but we've already proven that the conjugate uh, of the subgroup capital H under the element little g has the identity element. Okay, so the identity is an element of this. Okay, and I'll repeat the argument there. It's because when we're going through all the elements of the subgroup capital H and conjugating them by little g to construct the conjugate of the subgroup under little g, one of the elements that will end up conjugating by little g will be the identity which always is an element of the subgroup. Okay, and when we conjugate the identity by anything, we just get the identity. So that's why the identity will always be in the conjugate of the subgroup capital H under the element little g. So we will indeed have the identity in this uh, subset. Okay, and then the fourth and final axiom to prove that this conjugate of the subgroup under the element little g is actually a subgroup is that we need to prove that you have inverse elements. So again, we need to prove that if we take an arbitrary element in this conjugate of the subgroup capital H under the element little g, uh, that uh, its inverse element, which we know is an element in capital G, is also going to be within there, basically. Okay, so, again, let's take an arbitrary element uh, from this subset. So, an arbitrary element will look like this, GH, G inverse. So, here's my arbitrary element from the conjugate of the subgroup capital H under the element little g. And again, little h is some arbitrary element of capital H. So, I've got some arbitrary element here within my conjugate of the subgroup capital H under the element little g. And what I now want to prove is that it also has a two-sided inverse that is present in this conjugate of the subgroup capital H under the element little g. Okay, so the way I'm going to do this is I'm just going to tell you what the two-sided inverse of this is going to end up being, and then I'll prove that it is indeed the two-sided inverse. So the two-sided inverse of this element, which is an arbitrary element of the uh, conjugate of capital H under little g, is going to be gh inverse g inverse. Okay, so h is some element of the subgroup capital H. It will have an inverse element which will also be in the subgroup capital H. Okay, so this element, 
the inverse element of little h conjugated by g will be an element of uh, the subgroup capital H conjugated by little g. So this absolutely is an element of the subgroup capital H conjugated by little g. Okay. What I now want to prove is that this is in fact this thing's two-sided inverse. So if I compose them together either way round, it gives me the identity element. And therefore I've proven that for an arbitrary element of my subset, uh, that I've got its inverse element, its two-sided inverse, uh, also present within this subset. Okay, so let's do that. So let's firstly do it this way round. GH, G inverse, composed with GH inverse, G inverse. Okay. Now, why does that equal the identity element? Well, it's beautiful. G inverse composed with G is equal to the identity element, so we can instantly get rid of those two middle bits. Then what will we have? Well, what will now smash and annihilate each other? It will be H and H inverse. They'll bang into each other now, okay, once this middle bit's gone, and they'll annihilate each other as well, so we'll just get the identity from all of them. So all of the middle four things have now gone, and what we'll then end up with Again, is G will meet G inverse here, and we'll get another identity. So the entire thing will simplify down to the identity. Okay, now let's do it the other way around. So let's take G H inverse G inverse in the front this time, and we'll compose it with G H G inverse. And again, the same beautiful thing happens. G inverse will compose with G to give the identity again. Okay. This time we'll get it the other way around, H inverse composed with H as opposed to H composed with H inverse, but that of course doesn't matter. Okay, so H inverse will compose with H to give the identity. Okay, and then again, once they're gone, uh, you'll then get this G smashing into this G inverse, and that will then give me the identity once again. Okay, so the entire thing again simplifies down to the identity. Okay, and I'm sorry this is going off the screen. Okay, but I hope the message is clear. This thing is um, this thing's two-sided inverse. This thing is an element of my conjugate of the subgroup capital H under the element little g. Okay, so for an arbitrary element of the conjugate of the subgroup capital H under the element little g, I can find you another element that's also in there, which is this thing's two-sided inverse. Okay, so this um, conjugate of the subgroup capital H under the element little g is closed under inverses. Okay, so it does obey axiom number four of group theory. So it is a subgroup. Okay, right. So that was an introductory video to the concept that you can conjugate a subgroup by another element of the larger group, uh, little g, and that you can end up with another subgroup of the group capital G. Okay. We are going to use this fact in future videos, okay? So this is just intended to be an introduction to this concept and we will use it in future videos.